Can we still believe as modern people living in the 21st century that we are not the result of Darwinian evolution but are created by God in his image and likeness? Does this mean that we resemble God in some way? In which way? And is it possible somehow to reconcile special creation with Darwinian evolution? Let us ponder on these issues from a Christian perspective, but not before starting with the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Physicalists follow the assumption that only matter exists and that God and belief in life after death are illusions meant to stamp out a primitive fear of the unknown. As I've already said in previous episodes, this is just a physicalist assumption that cannot be scientifically proven. Christians follow another assumption that God created the physical world as well as physical and non-physical beings. There is nothing scientific in following these assumptions or in rejecting other assumptions, no matter who affirms them, for the fundamental tenets of a worldview are not the result of scientific inquiry. Nobody can claim that he or she discovered God or that God does not exist by following a scientific inquiry. Just consider the physicalist assumption that God does not exist. Who would be entitled to affirm it with scientific certainty? How much knowledge would a person need to be certain that God does not exist? Obviously, all possible knowledge, which none of us has, not even all of us combined. It would take an all-knowing person to affirm there is no God. But only God is said to be all-knowing, so only he would be entitled to deny himself, which is absurd. Since God is beyond our capacity for scientific investigation, he can be known only if he takes the initiative to disclose himself in ways which would make sense to us. As you remember from episode 1, his reaching out to us is called revelation and the means by which we respond to his revelation is faith. Christian faith is not the sum of superstitions about things that mankind could not understand about nature, but the result of God's initiative in revealing himself to us. His revelation is presented in the Bible as a historical fact which took place in the history of the people of Israel and reached its its peak in the historical person called Jesus Christ. Another clarification needed here concerns the language we use in affirming things about God. In short, our knowledge of God is expressed in analogical terms, not in univocal or equivocal terms. Univocal terms always have the same unique meaning regardless of the context. For example, the word hemoglobin has a single meaning. Regardless of the context, it represents the red blood cells that transport oxygen and carbon dioxide. When we talk about God, we cannot use univocal terms because he is not a human being like us. But neither can we speak of God in equivocal terms. An example of an equivocal word is bat. This word has at least two entirely different meanings. It can refer either to a kind of a stick used in baseball or to a flying mammal. 
we could not talk about God in equivocal terms, for it wouldn't communicate anything about him. But there is a third way to talk about God, because something of our words can apply to him. For example, there is some similarity between saying that God loves us and that we love our spouse. The way we love one another somehow resembles the way God loves us. It is neither the same thing nor the opposite. God gives us our personal existence and reason to be able to receive his revelation in the analogical way. Now we can extend the use of analogical thinking by saying that something in our nature resembles the nature of God. This something is our personal status. As a general principle, we can understand the religious view on human nature only after having some understanding of what God is or what ultimate reality is in that religion. In other words, human nature flows from the nature of God. The two cannot be separated. I'll explain this principle in all religious views we'll encounter in the upcoming episodes. The Christian view of God is that of a communion of three persons, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, who share the same essence. This view did not arise to mere speculation by theologians, but is the result of how God has revealed himself in the Bible, and of how his nature was expressed by the early church fathers and the ecumenical councils in response to his revelation. The puzzle of how one God can consist of three persons was addressed by the church fathers of the 4th century, especially Athanasius the Great and the Cappadocians, that is, Basil the Great, Gregory of Nyssa and Gregory of Nazianzus. Their encounter with Greek philosophy and the conflict with heresy made them look for new ways in which to express Christian doctrine. Their solution was to make Christian doctrine intelligible by using the Neoplatonic terms of usia and hypostasis to express the nature of the Trinity. In Neoplatonic philosophy, the Greek term usia was used for the impersonal essence of reality, while its determined, manifested singular forms were called hypostases. If the church fathers were to teach Greek philosophy, they would have said that the hypostases, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, were mere functional aspects of the divine nature usia. But the transformation in meaning of these Greek philosophical terms was to say that each of the persons of the Trinity has the fullness of divine nature, and therefore the ultimate reality is defined by the reality of the three hypostases, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, and the relationship that exists between them. In the word hypostasis, we find the origin of the term person, for it comes from its Latin form persona. In Christian terms, person is not how impersonal ultimate reality can be manifested, but the only way it exists. In other words, there is no ultimate reality beyond and above the persons of the Trinity. Father, Son and Holy Spirit as persons are the ultimate reality. Although this introduction to the nature of God may seem boring Christian theology, I had to mention it, 
for we need to understand that God is supremely relational in his very essence. As such, God is self-sufficient and does not need to create the world in order to be complete, as he does in other religions. He creates the world freely, without external constraints, without using pre-existing matter, and without altering his nature. Against the physicalist assumption that matter exists by itself and organized itself along billions of years to produce humans, the Christian view is that God created the universe out of nothing by simply calling things into existence. And not only did God create the world out of nothing, but, but he also keeps it in existence. For this reason we say that everything has contingent existence, that is, it depends on the sustaining act of God to exist. I quote from the Catholic Catechism, which says, By creating it, God does not leave his creation to chance. He not only gives it being and existence, but keeps it in every moment, gives it the power to act and guides it to its goal. As all the rest of creation, the human being is called into existence from nothingness and is sustained in existence by the power of God for nothing outside him can exist by its own resources. Since there is no essence inside human beings that could survive death by its own nature, as there is in Hinduism, for instance, humans must be held in existence by the power and will of God. We are created out of love, as persons capable of responding to his love. This means that personhood is not a result of Darwinian evolution, but the gift of our Creator, a way of being that reflects the way God exists in analogical terms, as the communion of Father, Son and Holy Spirit. This is very important for a proper understanding of the Christian view of human nature. We are persons called to communion with God, as we are told in the very first article of the Catholic Catechism. I quote, God, infinitely perfect and blessed in himself, in a plan of sheer goodness, freely created man to make him share in his own blessed life. For this reason, at every time and in every place, God draws close to man. He calls man to seek him, to know him, to love him with all his strength. Now we are a step closer to a right understanding of what it means to be created in the image and likeness of God. We find this expression in the creation account in Genesis, where God said, Let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. The traditional way of explaining the concept of being created in the image of God is that we are rational creatures, invested with reason and free will. This is what makes us persons, not just living beings. Our rational nature makes us capable of imitating the relational nature existing between the persons of the Trinity. The Catholic Catechism tells us, being in the image of God, the human individual possesses the dignity of a person, who is not just something, but someone. He is capable of self-knowledge, of self-possession, and of freely giving himself and entering into communing with other persons. And he is called by grace to a covenant with his Creator, to offer him a response of faith and love that no other creature 
can give in his stead. The difference between image and likeness is that the image is given by our rational and relational nature, while likeness is an ideal to be attained, the way our personal status is perfected. In other words, the image is about what humans are. It expresses our personal status, which is the necessary condition to being in a relationship with God, while likeness with God expresses the perfection of this relationship. It is the result of a process in which we conform ourselves to this ideal. True likeness is attained by the perfected human being. So image is a gift, while likeness is a process and a perfected state of communion with God and other humans. Now in the second part of this episode, I'll comment on the way the creation account relates to the more modern way of understanding human nature as the product of Darwinian evolution. We often hear that evolution would be the scientific way of explaining our origin, while special creation is just a myth. But this claim is itself a physicalist assumption, for evolution cannot be scientifically proven. If one follows the assumption that there is no God, he or she has no other option than to accept that the earliest forms of life appeared as a result of random chemical reactions between simple organic molecules and that all species appeared as a result of random mutations and natural selection. Evolution is a physicalist form of faith, a fact so concisely expressed by C.S. Lewis quoting his contemporary professor Watson. Evolution itself is accepted by zoologists not because it has been observed to occur or can be proved by logically coherent evidence to be true, but because the only alternative, special creation, is clearly incredible. In the description, I suggest a few books that emphasize the fragile assumptions which lie at the foundation of Darwinian evolution. These are worth studying because evolutionism is too easily accepted, even by Christians. The best resource for prebiotic evolution, that is from simple organic molecules to the first living cell, is this, Charles Taxton, The Mystery of Life Origin. It argues that several assumptions held concerning this stage of evolution are absurd. Let me mention just a few. Oxygen was not present in primitive atmosphere, or else the first proteins, fats and carbohydrates would have been destroyed. The primordial soup accumulated in the primitive ocean was concentrated enough for organic reactions to occur and for more complex molecules to be produced. Once formed, these complex molecules did not disintegrate by hydrolysis, ultraviolet light and heat, and the probability was high enough for a random process to result in complex molecules of the kind that exist in living organisms. Once you study these issues of Darwinian evolution, you realize that it is just a philosophical theory which is uncritically held by those who accept its assumptions, that God does not exist and everything must be explained in physical terms. This theory should not pose a threat for Christians, nor should it lead them to finding a compromise, such as affirming that God created living beings through evolution. This is an untenable compromise. 
a theory that tries to fix the problems of evolutionists by using God as a tool. According to this theory, God must have prevented complex organic substances from decomposing. God made sure that complex molecules were produced in sufficient quantity. He grouped complex organic compounds under the same membrane. Then he conducted the mutations to produce more complex organisms and then help them adapt to the new environment and etc. In other words, God intervened in all the stages mentioned above. Instead of being a creator, he becomes the one who fixes evolutionism, the one who overcomes probabilities and entropy. Instead of performing a single miracle, that of creation itself, this theory demands that he performs millions of miracles just to save this theory. So why should we accept such a compromise? Because that's what physicalists demand? Must God fix the difficulties of a theory created by those who reject him? Another issue for Christians that accept evolutionists is that they can no longer admit a single pair of humans at the origin of our species. Christian evolutionists hold that God chose a pair of people from the existing ones who appeared by way of evolution, and only those did he provide with a rational soul. But this generates a big theological problem, for it destroys the doctrine of original sin since it could no longer affect the entire human race, but only the descendants of that particular human pair. And from here arises yet another problem, the need for Baptist for all human beings, for we are all affected by original sin. You can find on YouTube a debate between Richard Dawkins and Cardinal George Pell, on the Genesis account of the first humans. I'm sorry, but I cannot insert it here for copyright reasons, but I've put the link to it in the description. At one point, the cardinal says, Adam and Eve, what do they mean? Life and earth, it's like every man. That's a beautiful, sophisticated, a mythological account. It's not science but it's there to tell us two or three things. First of all, God created the world and the universe. Secondly, the key to the whole of universe, the really significant thing are humans. And thirdly, it's a very sophisticated mythology to try to explain the evil and the suffering in the world. To which the moderator replies, but it's not a literal truth. You shouldn't see it in any ways as historical literal truth. The cardinal answers, it's certainly not a scientific truth, and it's a religious story told for religious purposes. At this point, uh, Dawkins seizes the opportunity and asks, I'm curious to know, if Adam and Eve never existed, where did original sin come from? to which the cardinal obviously cannot answer. So we need to be careful about the compromises we make with secular thinking, out of the desire to present our faith in a more acceptable and attractive way. Once we give up one pillar of our faith, many others will crumble. If we are eager to present a more scientific theory of creation, the first Christian teaching that has to be abandoned will be the need for baptism. Therefore, we must not question the veracity of Christian revelation, but rather evolution itself, for it seeks to explain our presence in the world in ways which are contrary to Christian revelation. 
Once we accept evolutionism, we open a kind of Pandora's box towards destroying other Christian distinctives, and we do not know where this destructive course will take us and into what it will transform Christianity. In closing this episode, let me come back to Taxton's book, to the dedication he wrote in the Romanian edition. See, he mentions here Revelation 4.11, which says, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. That is the key to understanding our world and human nature. God created the world and keeps the world in existence by his will and power. That is why glory, honor, and power are due only to him. In the next episode, I'll continue our inquiry on human nature by discussing the nature of our soul. Thank you for watching and God bless you.